Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem Studio with me, Amir Oren, filling in for Jonathan Hessen this week. And our topic, uh, as we are approaching 2023, is Israel's intelligence assessment, which obviously sums up the year uh, which is going to be uh, behind us very soon and looking ahead to 2023. What are the main uh, problems? What are the main threats which Israeli intelligence and especially military intelligence describes to the policymakers and indeed to the Israeli public? And with us are from uh, central Israel two uh, veteran intelligence officials, uh, Dr. Uzi Arad, a former intelligence division chief for Mossad, the political advisor for Prime Minister Netanyahu, and then the head of the national security staff, Dr. Arad, welcome. Hello. And uh, retired Colonel Eran Lerman, a veteran uh, official of uh, Israel's military intelligence, and then deputy head of the national security staff. Eran, hello. Under Ozi, I should say, yes. And, uh, well, under, above, this is between you to decide. Um, and with me here is Reserve Colonel Ruven Ben Shalom, a cross-cultural expert. So, Iran, let me uh, first turn to you. Uh, traditionally, uh, under the Israeli system, it is military intelligence, or AMAN, in the Hebrew acronym, which is tasked with uh, presenting the annual uh, threat assessment uh, and the regular uh, intelligence uh, analysis for the cabinet, for the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs and Security Committee of uh, the Knesset, and uh, in some unclassified form to the media and uh, the public. So first of all, is that the right uh, way to go about it? Or should Israel have uh, an amalgam of uh, uh, Mossad, Shabak, foreign ministry, and military intelligence, or perhaps all synchronized by the national security staff, and only then presented? Well, it's, it's always been a question that certainly became more acute uh, in the last 50 years or so, since 73, and the uh, very serious failure of analysis uh, uh, in Amman. And nevertheless, we have never, uh, there was never a decision in Israel to follow the model that we know in other countries in which, in some cases, it is the civilian uh, agency, uh, the, uh, the equivalent of our Mossad, which uh, offers the national security, national intelligence analysis, or um, in the case of uh, the American model, which emerged after 9-11, the function of the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, which is a sort of um, uh, office coordinating analysis and tasking for the entire uh, community. In Israel, it remained in the hands of the soldiers for a, a complex set of reasons, uh, but mainly because I believe uh, the DMI enjoys the privilege of uh, having access to young people who are the best and the brightest and uh, uh, have uh, sometimes need to compensate for lack of experience with uh, <clears throat> very profound personal uh, capacities. Uh, this used to be the um, <clears throat> mainly the um, point of advantage of our collection agencies, like 8200, the famous uh, SIGINT agency. But it is also now, after years of, uh, of uh, honing this capacity also for analysis, I think this is also part of what makes the, uh, the DMI still uh, the premier agency, even in analysis. Dr. Dr. Arad, you were on uh, both uh, sides as a producer of intelligence and then consumer or the uh, chief staff officer to the uh, uh, politician who is the uh, consumer in chief. Um, does the process look most optimal from uh, either side or um, is it um, open um, uh, to improvement? It is very much open to improvement uh, because Israel has never put together uh, an integrating 
body that would uh, uh, assemble the assessments of all the agencies, and there might be many, into one integral whole. Uh, we do not have uh, a national intelligence officer who is uh, uh, close to the prime minister and to the cabinet, uh, and is there to do that capacity. And that uh, shortfall is well uh, felt. Um, but at the same time, I must tell you that in our, in our case, when an annual assessment was presented by the military, it was a global assessment which uh, took count of every single issue, which is ridiculous because uh, you have primary threats and you have secondary and you have other theaters which are of no concern. Other countries uh, used to have uh, uh, the thing uh, split into, for example, in the American case, there was always the Soviet estimate, which was concentration on the main threat. Now, I would have expected in Israel's case, for example, that we should be, there should be one uh, integrated assessment, say, of the Iranian threat, which is the primary current regional threat to Israel militarily and from a national security point. And then there should be separate as, uh, uh, documents on other uh, issues, primarily of the, the ones in our vicinity, uh, the Palestinians and in Lebanon and so forth. And that's it. You do not need also to combine that with what we expect from China or from the Ukraine. That would have facilitated the matter. At the same time, uh, the present agencies that provide uh, such an assessment, they are all three of them, including the Foreign Office, and some of them uh, uh, be have become experts in certain areas. You would expect our security service to be uh, leading the camp when it comes to Palestinians um, in Gaza and elsewhere, and also uh, to our what is happening in our immediate territorial vicinity. You would expect uh, the Mossad, for example, to possess expertise on the Iranian issue. And you would expect the military to have expertise on many, many uh, issues, including everything that has to do with military activities. So uh, there is a degree of specialization there. But let us not uh, go too far um, in giving significance to those assessments. Uh, assessments of that nature, which are not focused in a, a, a matter of ritual, uh, do not touch on what can be the most immediate and relevant. These uh, uh, call for separate uh, assessments. And in our times, in our times, due to the fluidity of so many issues, I do not envy the task of any assessors who are trying to figure out what is going to happen next. Uh, so the intelligence community today is very much at a loss uh, for trying to really assess the current situation, unless we're talking about hardware or facts, and certainly is in no position to estimate what may happen uh, in, in weeks' time or months. Even facts are in dispute uh, uh, in recent years, unfortunately. Some politicians um, have turned uh, to um, uh, spreading fake news. Um, or alternative facts. But let me turn the question to the operator, uh, who is also an expert on uh, foreign military liaison. Um, when it gets to your level, both in your contacts with your uh, American and other colleagues, and um, as an Air Force uh, pilot, do you really care what uh, these guys down in Tel Aviv write in their annual assessments? Or do you need more concrete um, intelligence in order to translate it into actionable plans? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a complex question. I think culture does play a part. Uh, some of the things, uh, the interesting points we just heard now have to do with our organizational culture, the way we evolved. Some of it are disadvantages, but also remember that our structure has many advantages. The fact that we basically, Israelis, adhere to no rules. Uh, we don't uh, consider boundaries, certainly not organizational boundaries. We don't go and look up in a constitution, which we don't have 
who does what for who, and we work together seamlessly many times. So I think we see we have a great success story in our current organization. As operators, what I what I see when I look at my friends from around the world is many times they look up and they can see a structured strategy. It's it's online sometimes. It is clearly defined and written, and it goes all the way down to the operational orders. So it's clear what the president or the prime minister wants, and it comes all the way. In Israel, we rarely have that. So you, if I ask you, what is Israel's policy or interest right now? Hard to say. Another important thing to say about intelligence is that the intelligence, which now is a much larger organization because there's so many more sensors, it's so much more complicated. But bottom line, with all that data, the prime minister or the people in authority have to take all that and decide. It's ultimately a decision. What is the scenario? We call it in Hebrew, reference scenario. What is the reference threat? And that decision really drives what I need to prepare for as an operator, what tools I need, what kind of training I need to do, what missions I have to prepare for. So ultimately, even in our Israel, it does boil down to that where when operators train, they're training for that scenario that the leadership decided is the scenario we probably or may need to prepare for. Uh, Dr. Lerman, a couple of weeks ago or so, um, you had um, one um, of your uh, successors um, in the uh, research and analysis uh, uh, department of uh, military intelligence, uh, Brigadier General Amit Sar, present a declassified or unclassified uh, version of the annual uh, threat assessment. And uh, it seems as if um, uh, General Saar uh, made the point of distinguishing between the important and the immediate. Um, the important or even the crucial uh, longer term being Iran, which Uzi Arad touched upon, and the immediate is the Palestinian community, uh, especially in the West Bank, perhaps in Gaza, and perhaps even Israeli Arabs, uh, should a conflagration um, arise, uh, as it did uh, uh, in May of 2021. 20, uh, Do you, as um, a veteran observer of the scene, accept it, or is it too much of a conventional wisdom? Well, um, I think the classification is... is uh a uh, simplification this classification of the immediate and the uh, and and the important is to some extent um, uh, directed at the public which is increasingly uh, i would say uh, distracted from the main issue by um, daily events uh, on the on the palestinian front and um, i would not discount the possibility that the, the, uh, the General Saar and others in the uh, intelligence establishment are also be trying to signal something to the incoming government. It is one of the functions of, uh, of, military, of intelligence officers generally, military intelligence officers specifically, to um, uh, basically speak truth to power and to some extent, the fact that they are soldiers gives them the capacity to do so. And they're not as easily moved uh, about as, as uh, um, civilians in the uh, prime minister's office. And, and uh, the challenge right now is to, keep, to uh, help keep this uh, incoming government, uh, the post-election incoming government focused on uh, uh, as, as the main issue, uh, gl uh, what, the, what the Russians used to call Glavni Protiv. I agree with Uzi that, that for many years until the Soviets collapsed, the uh, U.S. intelligence community fixed on one challenge above all, and we should uh, be focused on one challenge above all. And therefore, it is, I, I, I would read it as a signal. Um, that uh, we need not allow, we cannot allow ourselves to be detra uh, distracted, uh, painful as some events may be on the Palestinian, uh, I wouldn't call it a frontier, on the, on the happening on our, our uh, interface with the Palestinians, uh, because there are much larger issues looming. Dr. Arad, you have uh, studied uh, academically as well as uh, uh, professionally in your career, the uh, lines between intelligence and policy, 
both in the United States, in Great Britain and other places, and you have been present at the creation of the National Security Council, later renamed National Security Staff. So uh, what happens when policymakers, that is the political echelon, get the intelligence assessment and they um, see in it what uh, uh, Iran Lerman just indicated, they see a signal that they should uh, vector their policies so that the uh, threats described uh, could also be um, uh, solved or uh, responded to. Um, you must be the uh, bearer of bad news when you come to the uh, decision maker, the prime minister primarily, and tell him, listen, uh, according to our assessment, the Palestinians are about to start another intifada, but if you do something, or even if you do A, B, and C, if they cross the line, you may avert it. So how do the politicians regard such assessments? Uh, well, I mean, it, it is much more complicated than it is. it used to be now. Uh, if you look at the matter, when you factor into this, the policymakers' conduct, perspective, attitude, and the fact that he is the commander in chief uh, of, of the various agencies. Uh, there are a number of ways in which uh, the policymaker is the one who essentially affects, shapes, or relates to the intelligence that he is uh, confronted with. One is that he, uh, in recent years, uh, you have seen that the policy of appointing uh, uh, senior military personnel or senior officials in other capacities, or even intelligence officers is uh, colored by what um, that individual uh, is known to have by way of outlook or past behavior. So this is one form to politicize the matter. Um, and that colors uh, what then uh, that person produces when he walks into the office. Another possibility, which happens very often, intelligence uh, services usually assume to be omnipotent and in some in a way know a great deal. They are not aware that there are many things that the policymaker knows much better than they. And they are often the ones who are um, not given uh, details of facts of, of activities and so forth. So the policymaker, when he listens to the intelligence, he sometimes realizes that he knows more about his own policies, his own actions, in all his own dealings, whereas uh, the, the, the intelligence services are blinded. Uh, that changes the balance of who has the information. Thirdly, is, is the fact that um, all too often, um, there is a difference of judgment and the policymakers, particularly when that person is a veteran who's been around, uh, believes that his judgment is as valid, if not better, than the judgment of the intelligence uh, people, and they have an issue. Um, and on many, many such issues, uh, the, the distribution of truth is not that the intelligence have facts and truth at their hands, and the policymakers is a gullible or sometimes manipulative consumer. Uh, sometimes the roles are reversed. Finally, you do have politicization of intelligence by intelligence officers who want to please or do not want to antagonize or adjust their policies, or you have the converse. You have uh, the case in which uh, the policymaker himself uh, disregards and disputes uh, what uh, the intelligence are telling him. Now, we've seen that in America uh, throughout the time in which President Trump was in the White House, his attitude toward his intelligence people was terrible, dismissive, to my mind, irresponsible in so many ways, but that was a fact of life. He did not relate to them as the providers of truth to power. He despised them, he ridiculed them, and he ignored them. Uh, but even in Israel, 
uh, we have some variations of the same theme that uh, that intelligence officers do not command necessarily the highest of respect. Uh, for example, um, it has become the habit of uh, in the Israeli military that the chief of intelligence uh, usually is a military man of uh, substantial uh, military experience, but very limited intelligence experience. Now, how that affects his own performance is to be seen, but that does not, does not uh, help him when he sits in front of a, of a prime minister who has been handling intelligence as a consumer for 10 years or more, whereas the chief of intelligence is a newcomer to the world of intelligence. So all these things are blurring uh, the line uh, between uh, intelligence providers and intelligence consumers, and sometimes they operate in dual capacity. And uh, that is a fact of life in the current state of affairs. It's been so in certain two countries which are important to us, Israel and America. Reuven, uh, what, what uh, Uzi just uh, recounted uh, brings to mind the question of uh, accountability. In Israel, um, uh, several times, commissions of inquiry uh, have spared the political echelon, but uh, sculpted the intelligence along with other professional uh, officials. Um, and when you um, sat and um, heard and watched General Saar, uh, you probably uh, thought about it, including uh, the, uh, the fact that General Saar, as a subordinate to now General Aharon Khaliva, a major general, Brigadier General Saar is his subordinate, um, the chief of intelligence and research is the chief assessor. The uh, uh, commander above him, uh, who has many other responsibilities uh, with the operations of the intelligence branch, um, is usually just echoing, he can uh, color it by his own views as a member of the general staff. But usually what comes up through the um, assessment uh, department is what the cabinet and the others hear. What were your views when you heard it? Well, first I thought it was a very good presentation. And I was thinking exactly about those points the whole time. Also, probably someone who deals with cross-cultural issues, I noticed something that you did not. And that is the general said several times, I think. He didn't say, we assess, the IDF believes. He says, uh, many think this and this. You know what, but I think, you think, personally? That's a fascinating issue, and I don't think it's just something that's you know, said without intention. Uh, certain, the, all the issues that we discuss now say how difficult their position is. Certainly the trauma of the Yom Kippur War means that when they say something, they have that in the back of their mind, even though I must say that I think they have to, in a way, put that aside and be true to their profession. But remember, again, they're not saying what's going to happen tomorrow morning. It's more setting the stage, explaining the circumstances. By the way, I do agree with uh, Iran that he said that they were, in a way, hinting to the government because they gave uh, strong emphasis on the Palestinian arena. For me, it was very interesting to hear uh, the general say uh, in terms of the youth there has lost hope. That almost sounds like commentary to the government. Listen, guys, they lost hope, and if you don't do something, this will erupt. But that also tells us what the military is. It's a small component of national security, unlike the mistake of changing the internal security ministry in Israel to the name national security. National security is a huge thing. Military is a small component of that. Sometimes we forget, mainly when we talk here, about all the intelligence, intelligence being housed inside the military. What I saw them do is point to the Palestinian arena as something that may erupt this year, extremely problematic, and the military here was saying, all we can do is manage and contain. We've been doing it okay, but guys, if you don't push this forward, if you don't solve this, if you put, don't put something on the table, we'll have another eruption, another confrontation. And certainly, as usual, dealing with Iran is our main challenge. Well, we should have uh, gone on about it for the next two hours, but we only have two minutes. So um, uh, one minute for each of you. Uh, Uzi, um, everyone remembers uh, the um, uh, faulty annual assessment of 1973. 
Um, some people remember the faulty annual assessment of 1967, but that one did not cause a disaster because the Egyptians behaved uh, in a different fashion when they surprised the Israeli government by entering Sinai. What should the Israeli intelligence professionals fear most when they present their annual assessment for the next year? A few words, please. Well, my rule of thumb, you know, early in my career, I, I, I blundered. And on a, some marginal issue, I dared to give a prediction only to listen to the radio the next day on BBC and hearing that exactly what I said happened the other way around. That was a very bitter lesson. And uh, the lesson has been never predict unless you have to. Do not volunteer your predictions. All too often, uh, you have intelligence officers who are drifting into sketching all kinds of scenarios, employing all kinds of fancy words, talking about all kinds of processes. Well, they should ad adopt a more quantum-like mode Iran, of thinking. Iran Lerman, in even a lesser number of no words. We all need to be humble about our capacities. What makes, should makes us, make us even more humble is what I used to call the uh, dark side of the moon from an intelligence point of view, namely our own country, Israel, about which we are not qualified to make predictions beyond the capacity of the average media consumer. And very often on many issues, it is Israel that makes the weather in the part of the world uh, uh, on which we are supposed to predict. Dr. Reserve Colonel Iran Lerman, doctor and veteran Mossad and National Security Staff official Uzi Arad, Reserve Colonel Ruben Ben Shalom. Thank you. Thank you all. And we will be back for another edition of Jerusalem Studio soon. Shalom from Jerusalem.